Welcome back to another episode of the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin. Thank you very much for joining me today. I do feel like I've been on a little bit of a hiatus. Last week, I didn't post an episode of the podcast. Really, it's only been, you know, there's one week gap between episodes, but it does feel like a long time. If you do follow me on Instagram at Animals at Home CA, you'll know why. I posted a story just kind of explaining a few things. Last week, I recorded an, or I even posted on Instagram that I was going to be recording an episode with Tony from V Reptile. And V Reptile was this really cool initiative where they were going to have a worldwide global reptile expo, and it ended up falling through. So I recorded the episode, and then the day after, Tony emailed me and said that the expo had been canceled, which meant I couldn't use the episode because then the episode really would have served no purpose because we talked about the virtual expo the entire time. And I was also supposed to record an episode with today's guest earlier, about a week and a half ago, and about 45 minutes before I set up the interview, my laptop broke and I had to go buy a new one. So it was kind of a cluster of a week and a half there, but I'm finally back up and organized. And as I said on Instagram, I have some really cool and interesting announcements that are coming up. So stay tuned for that. I'm very much looking forward. There's going to be a little bit of an expansion happening here, and I cannot wait to share that with you guys. So stay tuned for that. If you are interested in supporting the podcast, you can share the content on Instagram or Facebook or however else you want to share the content and also give the podcast a five-star rating on the Apple Podcasting app. Both of those are always hugely appreciated. And before we jump into today's episode, I want to thank CustomReptileHabitats.com, who is the sponsor of the show. If you want to check them out, you can head to the affiliate links that are in the description or the show notes. And if you do follow them on Instagram, you'll see that they recently upgraded into a much larger facility. I've talked to Paul, and I know that is because he is ready to ramp up production. I think there's even a couple employees there now. So it's going to be awesome. So very much looking forward to the increased production of those enclosures, because as I've said a million times, they are an absolute game changer when it comes to quality reptile enclosures in the reptile industry. So a few weeks ago, I mentioned I received a book in the mail from Joe from Port City Pythons. I was on his podcast from the ground up a couple of months ago now, and in the podcast, we were talking about the Amazon, and he asked me if I had read the book Mother of God by Paul Rosalie, and I said I hadn't. So he was kind enough to ship me the book, so thank you very much, Joe, if you're listening to this. I, I That was amazing, totally unexpected, and it was funny because he shipped it from the States, and in, I live in Canada, and of course, with all these lockdowns and everything, it probably took almost seven maybe even eight weeks to get to me. We both almost completely forgot he'd even sent it. And when I got it in the mail, I didn't even know what it was. But anyway, I opened it up. The book was Mother of God by Paul Rosalie. And it was a fantastic book. I essentially read it cover to cover in probably five or six days. And I'm a very slow reader, so that's fast for me. But the whole book was just amazing. It's centered very close to where the land of the the, the parcel land that Amazon Rainforest Conservancy has, which is a charity that, of course, the, the Animals at Home podcast supports. So all in all, it was just a, a really incredible read. And I'm very honored to say that today's guest is Paul Rosalie, the author of Mother God, as well as his new book, The Girl and the Tiger. In this episode of the podcast, we discuss everything from Paul's thirst for adventure, his insane solo adventures and solo treks that he's done into the Amazon rainforest. We discuss the importance of the Amazon rainforest for the planet and the importance of conserving it. We also discuss just the importance of being in nature and how healthy that can be for a human. Just getting away from the city and and putting yourself in a forest doesn't have to be a tropical rainforest, but even any forest near your area, how important that is for your mental health. And we finished the episode off with discussing the Discovery Channel show that Paul was a part of a few years ago, Eaten Alive. You may remember this. It caused quite a stir of controversy. This was when a gentleman who was happened to be Paul intentionally had himself constricted by a anaconda, a wild anaconda from the Amazon to see if it would if it could actually consume a person. Now, this was definitely sparked a ton of controversy. Like I said, we discussed it from Paul's point of view, whether he would do it again. And it sort of reminded me of the whole Forrest Gallant extinct or alive Sega, where it really starts to enlighten. It was interesting hearing Paul's side because anyway, I'll let him dis- discuss that, but it, it shows you how the corporate network interest is all about entertainment and the people in the documentaries really have almost no say of how things go. So that's at the very end of this episode. Really interesting. I really hope you enjoy it. Before we jump into the show, this episode does have a course language warning, so listener discretion is advised. I will talk to you after the episode. Enjoy. Cool. All right. Sounds good. Well, Paul, thank you very much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, man. I'm stoked to be here. Well, obviously, I've read your book, Mother of God, and I, some people have will have we- as well and will recommend them that way. And one thing that jumps out immediately 
when you read that book is how much of a naturalist or, or man of nature you are. And I have to share this moment that we had emailing back and <laughs> forth earlier. One of the things you'd said to me is, I spend the morning in the woods, so anytime after 2 p.m. is perfect. So that was like the most Paul Rosalie thing you could have said <laughs> after reading your book. <laughs> so yeah. tell me about that. Tell me about what you do. What's your morning routine? Uh, well, I, I kind of, this has been like my quarantine conversion. I mean, you know, everything shut down. So I, I, I don't know. I mean, I kind of got to this point where professionally and, and just in my life, I, I had so much work all the time that I, I just worked, you know, and then everything stopped. I mean, my ecotourism is down. I, I'm not in the jungle right now. So I found myself all of a sudden able to go back to the woods. And so then once I rediscovered that, um, yeah, it's just, it's just, I've been spending more time in the woods than I have, you know, in my house and, and following game trails and just sort of like totally loving just the, the way the light goes through the leaves and finding deer fawns sleeping in the woods and just, you know, to trying out different things. And, uh, it's been wonderful. I, I'm, what I'm trying to say is it got a little bit too adult and hectic and busy there in my life without me even realizing it. And then when it, once everything got ripped away, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of been great. <laughs> yeah. There's something that I think, even if you are a city person at heart, which I'm not, but I know there are many people out there that are, there's something about getting into the forest that just, I think you only need about 10 minutes before you feel that sigh of relief almost where it's just this, it's, I don't even know how to describe what is going on there. Yeah. I've, I've, <laughs> If, if there's a video of this people, people people would laugh so hard but there's literally been times where i've gone like you know skidding off the road and like kind of side parked on some grass and just gone running into the woods because it's <laughs> you if you get stressed it really is there's nothing like it you go in the woods and sit down um yeah especially if you can get deep enough into the woods you know that you don't have any the chance of any people coming around where you're really just in the woods with the trees and the leaves and the whatever's happening there um man it just like fixes your brain and it's it totally not totally does it's not some sort of like hippie bullshit it's it's legitimately like this is where we grew up you know if you listen to like i mean i was listening to jordan peterson on joe rogan's podcast and they were talking about like well why are humans um stressed and anxious and it's like well because when you were used to be hunter gatherers you know it'd be like okay well this one's safe we got food for tonight but is there a predator coming what's going to happen next is a tribe going to attack us it's like we're made to worry um we're also made to be in the woods and we're made to be in nature and you're supposed to have sun on your skin and you're supposed to be getting i mean we all take vitamin b tablets now it's like well you're supposed to be getting that out of that of, you know from nature and it's like all this stuff when you live in a city you're on concrete you're in air conditioning you you do are in such an aquarium of a, of a, of an, of a fake environment really compared to what's out there. So yeah, to actually go and just sit in the woods, man, that's good stuff. <laughs> totally. I totally agree. And and there is, I think a lot to be said now about the amount of just bombardment of, you know, even things, this might sound a little conspiratorial, but you know, Wi-Fi signals and electrical currents coming through and all these different sounds for like, it's never quiet in the city. You can never find complete silence without, you know, putting yeah. in earplugs. And all of that is just your, like, like you said, that sort of animal part of our brain is picking up on all that. It's constantly being like, wow, we're not in a quiet environment. Is something going on? And we might not be consciously aware of it, but it's constantly like caching in your brain. There could be something happening here. Just, you know, nervous system bombardment. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't even think that sounds conspiracy-ish. Like, I think, I think it's just, there's so much that we don't even know about. I mean, there's always a motor running. There's always a thousand motors running. There's all kinds of, I mean, I don't know. We still seems like the verdict's out on Wi-Fi. I hear, I hear, I hear different views, but it doesn't matter because it's so much of it and the preservatives and the food and the, mm -hmm. just like you said, the noise. I mean, if you play noise like that to animals, they freak out. You know, there's, there's this footage of, of, of animals on camera traps in the jungle reacting to the sounds of chainsaws. There's uh there's, examples where like low flying planes over zoos have caused animals to like have seizures i mean we're not and then so i mean i i despite how wild i've become or i sort of was born i was i was born in brooklyn new york i mean and so like i guess the first few years of my life were you know you hear like cop sirens and ambulance sirens and car horns and like it's just the city soundtrack is so different than then I think I, I guess, I guess my DNA was just like, nope, this kid's going to be in the forest. Yeah. So from a young age, did you already have that deep thirst for adventure? Uh, yeah. I mean, that was, it was kind of nature, nature and nurture because mm -hmm. my parents, uh, 
you know, I mean, I, I think if whatever I wanted to do, if I wanted to be, you know, a ballerina, they would have been fine with it. But I was just like, get me to a stream, get me to a stream. I want to talk about dinosaurs. Oh my God, there's frogs, there's lizards. Lizards are like little dinosaurs. It was just like, I just, <laughs> you know, and then it was like, well, where does the stream go next? And, you know, where to, you know, where do deer come from? Or like, where do they go? Where do they sleep? And it's like, I just had all these questions. And more importantly than all of that was that I just, felt awesome in the forest i've always felt awesome in the forest and that's uh it's kind of funny that we're talking about this because this this last really this last month has just been um you know rediscovering that and of course i live in the jungle half the year but um kind of being in like these northeastern forests it's like it's like it's just literally going home it's like it's like going home and seeing your family again it's just like whoa i missed you yeah, I totally have the same feeling. Like I said, I grew up in the country as well. So as soon as I leave the city and sort of surrounded by natural yeah. scenery, it it's this deep sense of home. Like I, yeah, I always think great. to myself, this feels like home. It's so crazy. So yeah. in terms of your relationship with the Amazon, obviously growing up in Brooklyn, <laughs> how did the Amazon pop into your life? I know in your book, you sort of tell a story where it's sort of almost something where a seed was planted and then it just became something that you needed to go to. Well, because I liked... Uh, wildlife and nature so much, you know, that I was always at like zoos and we had all these like rainforest coffee table books as a kid. And I watched all the films, you know, at the end of every film, you know, you watch something about the jungle and then David Attenborough would be like, yes, but these trees soon will be felled. And you know, the the jungle's all dying and like, you know, go on with that. And that's what they leave you with. So then you're stuck. You're like seven years old, you're 10 years old, you're 14 years old. And you're sitting there and you just watch this incredible footage of this incredible place with all these beautiful animals everywhere and then they tell you that that's all gonna die and they're like okay go have a fun rest of your day bye yeah that's what it's like every, a funeral it's like a funeral and so you know they basically be like here's avatar here's jurassic park and it's all gonna you know it's like this is something that's part of your world and it's all dying so i found that horrendous and i actually remember uh, my mom read me an article about uh, one of the galapagos island uh tortoise species you know, that was, there was only one left. I think it was Lonesome George. And uh, when they, I mean, I was like seven years old. I was crying my eyes out. I was like, that's so horrifying that there's one left and it's never going to be any more ever, ever again. Um, and we, and that we did it. If it was natural, it'd be different, but it, we did it. And so that, that was a big part of me growing up. And also stuff like, you know, you watch, you know, I don't know, Last of the Mohicans, whatever. They, they can drink the stream water. We can't. Most places you can't do that. Yeah, because of us. I mean, my mom used to tell me, "Don't you know? You make a snowball." Uh, and I read something where they'd make snowball, some old timey thing, and they poured maple syrup on it and eat it. And I was like, "Oh, I want to do that." And she's like, "Oh, you can't. The snow is dirty." I was like, "How the fuck is the snow dirty? <laughs> like it's coming from the sky." Yeah, um, yeah. So all that stuff, and it was like, well, that made me feel like I was living in this like post apocalyptic children of men sort of reality, and. Anyway, yeah. So when I got old enough, um, I was completely fed up with high school and completely fed up with everything. And someone, I, someone sort of put it in my head that it might be possible to actually in real life go see the Amazon before it was all cut down. And, uh, and I jumped on that and I did it. And then I started and, you know, the second I set foot there, it was just like the start of a movie. It was like, it was like when they go through the gates and the, it was like the first time they see the brachiosauruses in Jurassic Park. It was just like, I looked up at those trees and like the music started and I was just like, oh, wow, this is where this is where it's going to happen. It is such a crazy, I've never been to the Amazon, but I've been to Costa Rica, so the Central American Rainforest. And yeah. it is, it's basically undescribable. And that's one of the problems yeah. with it is that if you've been there, it's very hard to describe to somebody what it's like because it is just so mind blowing. Like you could look at any point in your visual field and just find something to be totally blown away at. And it's, it's almost like an alien land in a lot of ways. If you're somebody that lives in North America, that's never been down there. It's, it's just bizarre is the only way to put it. Yeah, no, it's, it's absolutely crazy. Um, yeah, it's just like this giant mess of stuff. And and now I, you know, professionally bring people to the Amazon. So I get to see their reactions to it every time, which is, which doesn't get old. It's just the best job in the world because you get to see people's jaw just drop and uh, that, that, that sort of wonder, which is wonderful. So when you first went down, was it, was this just more for you to just see, see it so you could see it in person? You didn't really have any plans other than that. The first time I went down, I was 18 years old. I just was like, I want to go see it. And so, but I didn't want to go as like a, a tourist, you know, like I didn't want to like join like a whatever. And so I, 
and which is for, perfectly fine. Like, you know, but I, I just, for me, it was always about the conservation thing. So I wanted to like be part of a conservation project. And I, one of the things that I always tell people about that process is that at 18 with no skills, no experience, no research degree or anything, um, everyone I asked said, no, everyone, every researcher, every organization, every professor said, no, 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 no. When well, maybe when you're older, maybe if you pay us, you know, $10,000, maybe if you, and I was just like, this is ridiculous. And I just kept asking people, kept writing letters. It took a very long time to actually find something that was really legitimate. And then I found this indigenous guy who had set up a conservation area and was trying to protect some land on this river. And it seemed so remote and so ridiculous. Like it took days to get there by car. And, you know, they didn't even answer their email for months at a time because they were out in the jungle. Like it was like free. It just seemed, it was like saying like, mom, dad, I'm going to the moon. Bye. Like, I hope <laughs> I see you again. It just was crazy. And that was like 2006. So it was like right before you know, smartphones and, you know, zoom calls and all that stuff. It was, it was kind of different with the technology then. And Peru was a lot less connected. So it really was like going down there. And so I, you know, I went down there and connected with them. And the cool thing was, um, so this guy who was just, his name is JJ Juan, Juan Julio. And, uh, as soon as I went down there, it was sort of like, you know, there's all these students who were down there, um, you know, taking data, looking at birds and stuff like that. And I just showed up and I was just like, dude, show me everything. Tell me everything, you know. And I feel like a lot of people that go down there, they want to know what they already want to know. Like they have an idea they're like, you know, they're like, I'm studying bats or I'm studying, you know, my temperatures of water. And it's like, they'll go down, they want to look at that. And I was just like, man, teach me. Um, and he just took me out and showed me everything. And he was, you know, this sap will cure this. And this is how you know where the Jaguar lives. And this is where this, and and I knew a lot about snakes, which fascinated him and sort of set me apart because he was terrified of snakes. And uh, that terror of snakes eventually turned into me and him catching the world's largest anaconda together. But um, yeah, so I he, definitely he want to hear that. about that. Yeah, because yeah. that that this like one one of the things that's so cool about the people that live there is they have this just deep knowledge that you could never even really put into a book almost because it's just too complicated. Like you need to be there boots on the ground and they need to show you all these intricacies of, of what they've been living in their whole life. And it's just so fascinating. Yeah, dude, they're, well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you their level by, by sort of telling you my level. And that is that I've gotten to this really, I'm really thankful to where I've gotten to with forests because as I walk, I'm listening to, birds and i'm sort of aware of the weather and as a guide or even if i'm by myself i've gotten to the point where i start making decisions that are almost subconscious where i'll say you know oh i think i'm going to go down this trail and i end up seeing wildlife because i know what i'm going to see or if i take people out at night i can say oh this is a really good night for an amazon tree boa or tonight we're almost certainly going to see night monkeys or or, or it's, you know you can tell when the rain's coming and it's like that's not, it's not magical stuff. It's just that your body sort of, you sort of learn it. It's sort of just like, you know, in the city, I've heard, you know, the, the, I guess the counterpoint to that is there's just days where you like, you're driving, you're like, everybody is driving like a psychopath today. You're like, <laughs> yeah. everyone is just, this is just a different energy. And it's like, um, you know, like I've gotten to the point where I could hear birds chattering and know whether it's that they're yelling at a snake or if there's a jaguar. You know, I've, I've, I've not, and not specifically, I'm not like, I'm not like batting, you know, a thousand here. I'm just, but it's, it's just like a gut reaction thing. And the indigenous dudes are so far beyond that. Um, I bet. It's just like, you know, I've had, I've had JJ on the trail just be like, Hey man, can we sit down for a second? I'm like, what is it? And he's like, I'm not sure. And then like, you know, this herd of wild boar will pass by 20 minutes later. And he's just like, yeah, I knew they were coming. I was like, dude, they were out of earshot, out of smell shot. I was like, what did you like? what do you have like a weather vein in your, in your, in your nose? Like, come on. And he's just like, yeah, I don't know. Or like, stop. I need to fish right now. And it's like, do you really? <laughs> and then he pulls up like, you know, like a six foot catfish. And it's like, I mean, there's, we all know what a good fishing spot looks like, but that's next yeah. level. Like why, why did you stop the boat, jump out and be like, no, it's happening right now. Like they just <laughs> have this sixth sense that like, is almost unexplainable, but then at the same time, it's perfectly explainable. And it's like, it borders on magical. It's crazy. 
Yeah, and it's totally explainable because we see mm. wild animals behave in that way all the time. Oh, like totally. you, when a storm's coming in, they disappear. Like we, yeah. we see the animal instinct and and like we said earlier, we have that in us, but we've just sort of dampened it with regular society that we don't you're not in touch with it. And it would take years and years of being in the forest or I mean, you pretty much have to be born there, I'm sure, to, to yeah. be able to pick up on all of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I do have to say though, um, I think that when you when you practice it you can, you know, there's like, there's sort of like the front brain stuff where you could say like, okay, like this means this and I can look at this and you can sort of make these tactile decisions and, and, and learn factual things. And then as you put in that time, you start to get the other stuff, the, the deeper stuff. And it's like, um, it's definitely possible. I mean, I, I, I know I literally, one of, one of my close friends grew up I mean, I, I was, I was in the woods by the time I was like five or six all the time, but this kid grew up in the city, like upper West side of Manhattan. And it's one of the wildest people I know, like totally loves the forest and totally, you know, just, just incredible. You'd never know that he grew up in the city. So you clearly can learn it very quick. Interesting. Yeah. That's so very programmed cool. into us. Yeah. 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 It, it is an instinct. We'll probably just have to sort of uncover it in a way. And it, I mean, the Amazon obviously is a crazy place in terms of it can be very dangerous as well. So it's almost like if you, you need somebody like that to take you through there to make sure you do it safely and properly. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, that's one of the most comical things I get is um, every now and then we'll get like, you know, because I'm always saying like, give us money to help, you know, protect the Amazon and all this stuff. And every now and then I'll get funders and they'll go, you know, well, I, I just want to come down you know, I'm not a tourist. So I, I just want to come down with my tent and like, I'm like, you trust me, you don't understand, you know, they have this view of it. Like, well, I'm hardcore in my backyard. So I'm going to be hardcore yeah. in the Amazon. <laughs> it's like, buddy, I've seen, I mean, I've had, I've had camera crews that were like, you know, one camera crew showed up and they were like, uh, I said, what was your last gig? And they were like, oh, we were in Afghanistan with the soldiers, like filming, you know, medical evacuations and like roadside bombs and all this crazy stuff. And they were like, yeah, so we're pretty much ready for anything. Well, you know, a few days in the swamps and <laughs> they were not ready for anything. Yeah. Up just so neck. many horrible things. Yeah. yeah. Up to your neck with wasps and electric eels and anacondas and crocodiles. And like, trust me, you're, you're not, you're not as tough as you think. And no one is, I'm not saying, I'm not saying I'm like better than that, but I'm just saying the, the idea that anybody is, is going to be tough in the Amazon is kind of comical. Yeah, yeah, totally. So when you were obviously you spent you've been there basically your entire life going back and forth and but in the early days was there a moment in the Amazon that made you think, "Okay, this is going to be a major part of my life purpose, protecting it?" Yeah, um well, I mean, honestly, the second I the second the second I walked in there, literally that first moment that I stepped off of a boat and onto the land and saw the trees, I mean, I like fell to my knees and was looking at leaf cutter ants. And it's just funny because like leaf cutter ants is like, you know, it's like grass. It's like it's there every day. There's just leaf cutter ants mm -hmm. everywhere. And it's like, so like I had this like, you know, giant moment, this, you know, revelation. And all the local guys were like, what the hell's the matter with that gringo? Like, why is <laughs> why is he staring at the insects? Um yeah. but I, I to me, leaf cutter ants are mythical creatures. Um but no, then then I had a I had a, I caught a couple of years where it was all fun and games, and then we had an offshoot of the Trans Amazon Highway road come and and for anybody that doesn't know i mean basically rainforest destruction 101 the first thing you learn is as soon as they cut a road into it that's the end of it you know if you have a jungle and there's no roads most people can't get in there they can't penetrate it no one wants to lug a chainsaw or really walk that far in with their gun it's just too dense as soon as you build a road everybody shows up they start building farms they start burning down forests and everything changes so we had this road come in and all of a sudden we started losing ancient trees. We started seeing jaguars get shot. We started, I mean, it was just people started clearing land for farms and what was once this deep, beautiful, sacred, pristine forest turned into like some farmer's backyard. It just, you just got to, you know, it's like taking, I don't know. I can't even think of like, what's a good, it's like taking just like the center of Glacier National Park or Yellowstone and just like, putting a Walmart on it and, you know, mm -hmm. paving it. And it's just, it just turns, it just turns it into something completely different. And in the Amazon, you're talking about some of the most important, mysterious wilderness that we have left on this planet. So to watch that transition was pretty horrifying. So then I was just like, well, um, 
barely 20, but I think I found the hill I'm willing to die on because I can't mm-hmm. let this river get chopped up. And so since then, that's all I've been doing, writing Mother of God, doing documentaries, bringing people to the Amazon, searching for funders, um, protecting the river is really all I do. Yeah, because there is, like I was saying earlier, there's that, it, it is such a crazy experience to go, but if you've never been there, it's very hard to tell people. So it's almost difficult to make some people care that there's a highway being carved into the rainforest, you know, somewhere that's thousands, thousands of miles away, right? And I guess, you know, doing the documentaries and tours and whatnot is really the best way to do it. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, you have to tell people the story. That's why, that's why like writing Mother of God was good because people were like, oh, like I felt like I was there for a second or like taking people, um, because even scaring people doesn't work because everybody scares everybody. Like everybody's, Mm. um, you know, I feel like they'll tell you like, you know, if you don't, if you don't vote in the next election, you know, your, your views aren't going to be respected. It's like, all right, well, you know, sure. So, but the thing with the Amazon is, um, it kind of, it kind of overwhelms all those things because it's one of the biggest physical features on our planet. And so, you know, each road that goes into the Amazon, it's like pulling a brick out of your house. It's like, how many can you remove before there's a draft, before the rain gets in, before the whole house tips over. And if the Amazon isn't regulating our global climate, you know, and producing all of that moisture that's producing all that agriculture and food for the rest of the planet. I mean, uh, we're, we're talking about a very different reality and we're the first generation that's ever had to deal with that because for everybody else, it was like, oh, we can, you know, drop bombs in the ocean, kill all the fish. I mean, there's just so many fish mm-hmm. in the ocean that you could just do whatever you wanted. Who cares? Now we're seeing the fisheries collapse. You know, and then there's thousands of people out of work along the coast of Africa, and suddenly we have Somali pirates, and it's like, well, mm-hmm. look, look what you did. Now we have pirates. You yeah, know, it's, you made pirates come back. You made pirates come back because <laughs> things are scarce, and it's like, and it's like in the Amazon, it's like, well, when South America isn't getting all that rain from the Amazon, are they going to be able to produce all the agriculture that they export to China that makes Asia's economy possible? That that makes them produce all the, the merchandise that we buy from them. It's like the entire global economy is tied to the Amazon and the entire system of the Amazon is tied to the leaf cutter ants and all the tiny little things. I mean, an ecosystem is basically just birds and bees and things carrying seeds back and forth and creating trees. And, you know, in Asia you have like elephants tearing things down and it's, it's really, when you live there, you're like, Oh, all of these little stupid things are, making the forest and these giant trees grow and they're breathing things and they're releasing oxygen. And then you literally watch the steam come off the jungle in the morning and then you watch it like get sucked into a cloud and then it rains in the afternoon. And as all this is happening, you're drinking the river and then Mm. you're sweating and you're like, wow, the system makes so much sense. And I think that, uh, you know, whatever you believe in, you're like, well, nature makes a hell of a lot of sense when it's like in front of me like this, it's just so clear. And so if you mess with that system, you know, it's big enough that you can mess with it a lot. We've already cut down like 20% of the Amazon. And that's part of what I try to communicate to people is like, I'm not over here. Like we need to save mother Gaia. Like, you know, the earth is so spiritual. Like I'm like, dude, I'm all for like having fun. I love like planes, trains, Netflix, seeing my friends. Like, I think it's all great, but let's not kill ourselves and all the future generations. Like this yeah. is, this is, a, this is approaching a moronic level of stupidity. It's kind of like, you know, a good party is a lot of fun. It's like, but then like you have that one friend that just like can't stop. And it's like, dude, we, we did this last night. You don't, you don't need to, you don't need to just calm down. And yeah. There's this, this, exactly. this levels, this levels. <laughs> like, come on. <laughs> got to pull it back a little bit. Pull it back a little bit, man. <laughs> like there are definitely ways around, you know, carving a highway through, like you said, it may be more complicated, but we have to really look at the consequence of carving a highway through. Like, yes, it's going to make some things easier, but is it going to collapse everything around it? And one of the things that you you explain in the book so well is, you know, one of the things people always say with the Amazon is, oh, it's the lungs of the lungs of the earth, but you go into way more detail about specifically kind of why that's a bit of a misnomer and why that actually is true anyway. And also the, all the other things that happen, like the dust that comes over from Africa and yeah. all these amazing things that you just don't, you don't even realize, or the average person probably doesn't realize that the forest is doing and processing at all times. Oh yeah. I mean, it's so complicated that I don't think anybody knows everything that's happening, but yeah, I mean, you have the sun hitting the leaves and then all that happening with and the leaves hitting the ground and then all the fungus that's 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 chewing that up 
And all of the sticks and leaves and things that are getting washed down those rivers when they hit the ocean, it's actually phytoplankton that eats all of that organic material and then releases. So people are like, oh, the Amazon isn't the lungs of the planet. It's like, well, you read the wrong article and you're oversimplifying because if the phyto phytoplankton didn't have the Amazon nutrients, they wouldn't have food. So it is the Amazon. It's just not exactly, it's not just not being breathed out of the trees. And people's inability to understand nuance really just annoys me sometimes. But I understand that they they read it, they saw it on a BuzzFeed article, like, ha ha, we got you. The Amazon doesn't produce oxygen. Well, you're, you're still wrong. Um, yeah, it, it does. Exactly. Um, and yes, and that the Amazon, crazily enough, used to be connected to Africa, to the Congo, and that they still exchange things, that the Congo, you know, the, the, the sands from Africa still come over and, and fertilize the Amazon. Um, I mean, all this stuff, it, when you start saying it, though, it sounds so magical. It sounds like some Lord of the Rings stuff or like something. But it's like if you it's basically like that we're not smart enough or open minded enough or like, you know, you wake up and you're like, what's the first thing you think about? You're like, oh, I got to like, you know, take a shit and brush my teeth, like whatever. It is. <laughs> exactly. Like our, our, our views are actually incredibly animalistic. You're like, I'm hungry, you know, yeah. I'm worried. Let me check the news and like, let me like scroll through my phone for a while. That's like what, you know no one's thinking about the fact like, Oh my God, look at the, you know, the mist rising off the Hills. And like the fact that that could, we just take it all for granted. We're very involved in our human lives. It's like a, it's like a little termite nest where we're like, what are you doing? 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 What are you? And, uh, where it's like the, but if you really want to step back and think about it, all this stuff is happening around us. And sometimes being a conservationist is a really stupid job. Cause I'm like, guys, you can't pollute the water. I'm like, guys, stop polluting the water. And it's like, well, people are like, well, we want to pollute the water. We really want to. It. It's going to create jobs. And I'm like, but then you won't be able to drink the water. But like, but the jobs. And it's like, you have to explain to people that the only reason we're here is because of ecosystems, because they forgot that. And again, it's like, <laughs> you know, it's like, well, you you, ha you have to go to work tomorrow. It's like, well, why? Why do I have to go to work? Well, you're not going to be able to pay rent. Like, you just, you just can't, you just can't unreason certain things. Like, yeah, it's just, yeah, it's you, just moronic. Like, we're, the only reason we're breathing. Exactly. Yeah. You, you can't just throw a, a stick through the spokes of the bike and, and expect everything to be fine. Like this <laughs> lead water is not the best, but yeah. <laughs> at least I can afford it. <laughs> yeah. And again, like I'm, you know, I always, someone, someone at, a, I gave a talk recently and someone said, well, what would you do if you weren't a conservationist? And I said, well, I can't imagine that being the case because there's a million problems all over the world. And they're like, well, what if nature was fine? And there was like half the amount of people on earth and no species were going extinct. And I was like, shit. I was like, that sounds awesome. I was like, I was just like, you know, go on hikes and I don't know, maybe like help other humans. I don't know. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. It'd be so much fun. Like, it would just be like, cool. Let's like go see some crocodiles. Let's go whatever. It'd be like, let, you know, you could do normal human things, but it's like at this point, I, uh, I always say like, I, the, the, my, my biggest goal is putting myself out of business. I do not want to do this. Mm. Um, yeah, running that's around. A great point. Yeah. I mean, that's the goal of a conservationist. You want to, you want to protect all of the animals that you're trying to protect and then you want to go do something else. <laughs> And, you know, and one of the things that I see a lot, especially with some environmentalists and conservationists, is they have an incredibly sort of anti-human sentiment. And it, yes. in a lot of ways, it doesn't help, right? Because it just, you know, people have, like you say, we're, we're in the city, we're doing our jobs, we're worried about our bills. Like the last thing we need to worry about is the Amazon. Like I can barely afford electricity. And then you have yeah. some conservationists saying, also, you're the problem. You're you're actually one of the reasons the Amazon Amazon's being chopped down. And you go, wait, what do I mean? Like, I don't even have time to to look at that at all. So, and I don't, I didn't get any sense of that at all from your book. The book was really well done and it makes you understand how important it is. So it's almost like we need people to understand the importance, like how the impact it's going to have on their life without... That, like we still want to lay the problem at our feet. Humankind has done this, but when you attack individuals, it, it almost isn't very effective. Yeah. And also that whole, that whole thing of, you know, the anti-human thing it, that comes from like angry hippies or something. I don't know. It's like, mm -hmm. it's like those people that are like, they're not just atheists. They're like retaliatory atheists. Like somebody was too religious when they were kids. So now they're, now they're angry <laughs> yeah. about it and they got to yeah, tell yeah. everyone. Um, but it's like that with the environmentalists where people are like, oh, humans, like, you know, like I'll say like, oh, something and people be like, humans are the worst, man. Like, God, I just want to go live in the forest. Like, Good. Go do it. Please go do it. Yes. Go drop out of, of society and don't let us, please stop commenting on whatever post this is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. But no, it's not. And actually, um, that's a really good lead in for something that just happened while we're on this call. Um, 
so yesterday I posted a video of loggers in the Amazon and I was like, man, while everything's shut down, the loggers are going crazy, which is a huge problem and it's stressing me out. Was and, that the video of those two guys in a, in a little boat kind of yeah. going down the river? Yeah. Yeah. And like around them is, is all these logs floating and they, they had just, that, that's a basically like an ancient tree. That's like as thick as your house that's just been murdered. So that's like a really tragic thing. If you know, you know, if you look at it, you go, oh, it's some guys in some wood, but yeah, if you see where that wood comes from, um, and, and the crazy thing is that in the comments, a lot of people were like, you know, these heartless bastards, these people doing this stuff. And then, you know, I kind of tried to just gently remind them that actually most of these loggers are like really hardworking, nice guys who have no other options. So they're logging. And I employ a lot of them through my ecotourism business and like they're some of my best friends. Um, and the cool thing is I think I have the best people following me seriously because uh, the, the comments section didn't turn into like an internet dumpster fire. It actually was a lot of people being like, wow, oh, cool. I didn't even think of that. And like people sort of sharing those things. And so today I posted, um, one of my close friends, uh, is a logger who couldn't be a logger anymore because his knee stopped working because there's no cartilage in it. And, and so, and then he eventually, he, you know, he was a boat driver for us. And then like a few months ago, he couldn't even be a boat driver because he couldn't walk up and down the muddy banks of the river because his knee was so bad. And if he can't be a logger and he can't be a boat driver, well, then he definitely can't be a conservationist and his family's going to starve. So it would cost him, I mean, this is a guy who earns like $15 a day and then has to spend it immediately. He's got a sort of hand to mouth. So he would never be able to afford the $6,000 surgery that's needed for his knee. And so we put together a fundraiser on GoFundMe and I just put it up on Instagram six grand and uh while we're on this phone call it just reached its goal so we're going to change this oh guy's God. life you know it's crazy i'm like i'm sitting here freaking out because i'm getting updates and it's like i'm sure you know people are throwing in five ten dollars whatever but it's a lot of people and it's like when i so but that means that tonight i'm gonna get to call this man who can't walk right now who's wow. poor as hell and tell him we're getting you a new knee and you're going to be as good as new um this that is whole amazing. guy's life is going to change and and he's going to be a lifelong con this is a logger who's going to be a lifelong conservationist now because he's like dude you know it's so awesome driving these people around and getting to meet people from all over the world and i don't have to worry about like you know getting shot at or a tree falling on me this is this is so amazing and it's totally just like people being like yeah i'll help somebody it's great this is this is awesome so that's amazing that just so happened. we can do things you know, oh we can do we can do good things man it happens it just and, happened and right that- here that's amazing. That is so cool that that happened live right now. Right and now. You know, that was one of right the things now. that last summer when the, the fires were really bad in the Amazon and, and that was the sentiment that I continued to see is that like we got to stop these farmers from doing that. And I was like, these are not your farmers with a combine that are ripping to the forest. There's somebody that just, like you said, they're hand to mouth. They need, yeah. they see the value in the forest, but at the same time they have a family they need to provide for and, and sort of just throwing them under the bus like they're the criminal in this is, is not fair at all especially from somebody that's sitting in north america seeing a post on instagram yeah and i mean honestly it's the same thing again like the somali back back to the somali pirates why Mm -hmm. did those guys get to the point where they were desperate enough to rob a boat because um they didn't have any fish and they didn't have any money and that's the thing so overpopulation and the deterioration of ecosystems because even if you have a large population like in india you have an agricultural society where everybody sort of farms and fishes or hunts or whatever. And if there's enough nature, then there's, there's enough clean water, fish and cropland for everybody. When you have overpopulation, when you have the grabbing of resources like we've done, then all of a sudden you don't have resources usually for the poorest people, which is why they say that like climate change and environmental destruction affects the poorest people first. So it's really a humanitarian issue first. Um, which took me a long time to learn. Cause I'll, I'll be perfectly honest. I went to the Amazon and I was like, man, you know, fuck these loggers. I was like, I just want to go, you know, I'd, I'd say things like, you know, I'd love to just go like shoot the elephant poachers. Like, you know, I'd love to go poach the poachers. Like, mm-hmm. you know, it's sort of like tough guy talk that an 18 year old would, would throw out. Yeah. Um, and then you get down there and you, I mean, I literally went on, I used to go once I was, once I had been initiated through the JJ sort of school, I would go out with the poachers for weeks at a time, man. Like, and I would just, I mean, we'd be blowing away animals. I'd just be watching them do their thing. Um, and again, most of the time I was like, well, why are you doing this? And they'd be like, well, because gold mining 
they chase us and I'm like, well, you can't be a gold miner either. And they're like, well, what job do you expect me to do then? They were like, I've, I've been in the forest my whole life. My father didn't even wear clothes, you know? So now I have a cell phone and a sort of this, this Nike hat uh, and a motor. They're like, so I'm not going to go work at a bank. I've never even really been indoors. <laughs> so like, yeah, yeah, you know, if I kill 16 boars today and sell them in the market, that should get me enough money to buy a sack of rice. It's like, oh, wow this is a really simple problem. How much money are you making shooting boars? And they're like, well, you know, $10 a day. And it's like, okay, you know, we could pretty much employ you to do anything else um, for $10 a day. If, if you're talking about up North, the problem is there's a lot of people that have the same problem. Um, but again, the Amazon is so big that it actually can support that sort of lifestyle for most of the people, as long as it doesn't come become organized and industrialized and the problem with the logging is that now there's such a big demand from like Asia and the U S for hardwood timber that all the people are employed logging. If let's just say you went to Peru and shut completely shut the, the market or, or, or if, if we just said, we're not buying any more tropical hardwoods, that market would die in a second. There'd be, there'd be no reason for them to cut the trees. They would all just go do something else in a moment solved over overnight. Um, and so much of this stuff is like that. I mean, one of the one of the biggest success stories that I always tell people about is that humpback whales. I mean, we all love humpback whales. They're beautiful. They breach. We know they're really emotional. They, they migrate 25,000 kilometers a year, but they almost went extinct. People forget that. They went down to like 7,000 individuals after industrial, industrial whaling. And then the Commission on Whaling got together and said, we have to stop this. And some people, you know, 50, 60 years ago got together and said, we have to stop or else we're going to lose whales we can't lose whales and so they did something about it and as soon as we started not killing all of them they came back we're almost at pre-whaling numbers like humpback whales have been chilling and it's and like we find other so solutions easy. for what we're using them for well exactly like we don't need whale oil anymore for our lamps because we're not living in a <laughs> christmas carol anymore like it's like <laughs> yeah. you know exactly it's uh, i always say if you stop doing something that's immoral something else good will come from it and even if you can't even if they're like well what the heck are we going to put in our lamps like we don't know how, like we need our we need oil just stop killing the whales and that opens up a market for somebody to figure out something you know th someone yeah. else needs to come up with an oil and that's exactly what happened or the light bulb light bulb gets invented so it's yeah. uh you're right. It, it's, it, it is totally about managing the resources. And, and one of the things that you did in the Amazon or probably still do in the Amazon, which is so crazy, is you go on like solo <laughs> adventures. Yeah. And I think that pe people don't realize how no. huge the Amazon is. Like it is just like so vast. I mean, of course, it's being chopped down, but there's just oh, yeah. the vastness of it is just insane and how insane it is to go out there by yourself. But what is it that draws you to like these un these areas that have been untouched or ne basically could have you know never been seen by a human? Uh, I mean, just that. I mean, just the fact that, you know, to go somewhere uh where it's where there's no people where there's no roads no ambulances i mean you're right, so we're born you're born probably in a room that has you know several people in it and then you're with your family and then you're in school and then you're in doctor's offices and maybe the, i mean probably for most people the longest they've been alone is like in their room at night in bed and then you know but there's always a person like a phone call away or in the next room or something um we we don't really experience reality alone ever and even when we do, you go, let's say you go on a hiking trail, you're on a hiking trail, something that other humans made for you. Half the time it has a railing unless you're in the back country. And, you know, and so to really actually get to a place that has nothing to do with humans, that's just, you know, the last 10,000 years have taken place on this spot of earth and has not been messed with at all. That's, that's a crazy, crazy thing just to start with. And then you add with the fact that, that, some of these expeditions, it took me a week just to get to the starting point of the expedition. You know, so you like, you go to the last town, you know, getting to the last town takes quite some time. It could take you, you know, a week and a half just to get there. And then you have to get a boat ride up this river that doesn't have a name and get dropped off. And, um, you're just in this, in these absolutely just, it's, it, it is indescribable. It's just, just, just other worlds. It's just other worlds. I, I remember looking at the sky and I was like, the sky looks different. I was like, everything feels different. And then I started getting like, you know, sometimes you get nervous or stressed or something. And I was like, what if, you know, what if reality, what, was I always out here? It's like you very quickly just start, start freaking out because our, we're, we are social animals. We're not supposed to be alone actually. Mm -hmm. um, and so your brain loses it. My brain was all over the place, but then, 
you know, you're, you're sort of, I don't want to go out there with, to these really beautiful places with like a boat motor and gasoline and a bunch of loud noise. So it's like the only way to go is by yourself. And I always feel like, you know, if you go with someone else, well, what if they twist an ankle? What if they get hurt? What if they get scared? What if they get sick? It's like the easiest in this case, if you want to do it, you do it alone. And so I, I did, I did these solos to try and really, really connect with the jungle and really test myself. Um, and I've been, well, and, and so much of, of who you are as a person or we are as a person is probably totally integrated with society around us. And when you take yeah. that away completely, you probably start on like, you know, peeling off the layers and being, you, you almost probably don't even know who or what you are at some point. Well, exactly. I mean, when you, well, then you have to totally like get into this giant existential crisis of like, well, you know, are you a son, father, mother, daughter? What are you, what are you to your family? And then, well, what are you in society? And does your status matter? You know, this is not out there. It's just, you're just like, you you become an animal. And that's really exciting. Cause it's like, you're just moving. And it actually, to me, I don't know about everybody else, but to me, that feels good. I love being in the forest because your brain kind of switches off and you're like, I'm all, oh, I'm going to get from this rock to that rock. And it's like, well, a dog is capable of those thoughts. You know, it's like we, you just, you just kind of, just kind of zeroed in on it and it feels so good because you get back, you, you yeah. get into that flow state. It's, I mean, I yeah. used to be an athlete and that's like something that we would really work hard at getting into before we would yeah. compete is, is this like flow animalistic state and animals are perpetually in that state. That's just how they are. Yeah. And that, and that state, you're like all powerful. Cause it's like, you know, you watch an animal, you watch like a, a jaguar walk by an anteater and both of them are like, you want to fight? I'll fight you to the death right now. Mm -hmm. And and they're not worried like they about, they the just wrong like, move. like, I'd rather not, but if, if this is it, this is it. Like all cards. No, yeah. no, not at all. It's just like, it's happening. And that sort of presence of mind There's a famous, there's a famous image of, uh, I think it's like Michael Phelps swimming. And like, they're like the guy next to him is looking at him and Michael Phelps is just zeroed in on on the goal on the wall and it's yep. like you're you if you're if you're worried about what's coming next then you're you're probably too distracted to even do what you're doing right now and it's like i think that most of us are in a constant state of that because you're like oh i gotta pay my bills oh i gotta call this person oh i gotta send that email i gotta do this thing oh did at&t ever lately you're just like it's all scrambled up in your minds and uh in our minds and it's like we're constantly kind of entertaining ourselves and it's like well when you one of the things that I feel when I come back from the jungle is, you know, in the jungle, I wake up, you know, it's like 5.30 a.m., boom, it's not raining, I'm up. I go check on the boat, make sure it didn't sink during the night because the river can go up 15 feet, you know, and then then you're sort of, you, you always get distracted, you know, I'm like, oh, there's a new avocado on the tree, I got to do this and then something. And then you got to start taking care of everybody else and whatever projects are going on for the day and see what the rangers are doing. And it's like the jungle just sort of sweeps you up into this to this thing and it's like in this world when i wake up you know i wake up and it's like well i don't i don't actually have to do anything it's all in my mm -hmm. refrigerator you know and i can open my laptop and start working but you know it's yeah it's just it's a very different thing it just doesn't feel the same whereas there it's like i don't know it's like the rain comes and it starts raining it's like oh shit it's raining we gotta go you know everyone goes running to, to batten down the hatches because we gotta like get our gear inside and stuff and it's like um, I don't know. You're I think, forced I think, into the moment. Yeah, I think we're like too in control of our lives. I think like we wanted that like a long time ago, and then we got it. And I, I'm, I think that that's the reason that like half the people are on like some sort of antidepressant. It's just like we weren't meant mm -hmm. to have this kind of time on our hands. I totally agree. Yeah. Like, I wonder, what does it feel like to be in a place that is so remote that you know you could not, you can't send for help at all. Like yeah. this is totally on you to get out. Like there's no satellite phone. You're not, I, I don't think you had a satellite phone in some of these expeditions or maybe you did, but no, none but, of them, none of them. <laughs> so you're just totally exposed and it's all on you to make sure you can make it out the other end. What does that feel like? Um, well, it's, it's sort of, I mean, first of all, you're sort of, sort of playing Russian roulette because if mm -hmm. something bad happens, then you're really in it. Cause it's so easy for, like you said, twist your ankle. Now you're oh, screwed. You're in the God. middle of the jungle. I mean, the smallest thing can happen. I mean, I, I've been in the jungle and, uh, I mean, a tree branch will just break off of a tree 150 feet in the air above you. And I'm talking about this tree branch is the size of our oak trees here. Like, <laughs> and you have this giant ass thing that just falls. And if you happen to be under that, you're dead. Um, yeah. or if the storm, a storm blows up and the, you know, you can have an acre coming down because all the vines tie into the trees. So like sometimes like a huge area will just collapse. Um, 
And it's like, there's all kinds of shit, you know? And then so many times you, you'll say, okay, well, I know exactly what this section of the river is going to be like. Cause I just, and then it rains during the night and the water goes up or down 10 or 15 feet. And then what was like a quiet trickle yesterday is this raging torrent or what was a raging torrent that you could easily raft over the next day, the river goes down and then suddenly you're going to get bashed on these rocks. And it's like, dude, it just, you cannot, know what's going to happen and so yes going into that animal state where you're like yo i'm going all in and there's no way to replicate that um the only way i can make an analogy is like um there there was one time where i saw saw somebody pull a gun on another person and happened the person that got the gun pulled on them happened to be someone that had had this happen many times and had done military service and all that and you know, when you see it in the movies, it's like every movie has it, but in real life, there is no one that can, that can really not flinch when a gun is pulled on them. And that's something you can't manufacture it. Maybe you could build it by being in enough bad situations, but you go to any ordinary group of people and try it. Everyone's going to, everyone's going to duck out of the way. Everyone's going to put their hands up. It's, there's a certain sort of like reality threshold where it's like, whatever you talk about, however tough you think you are, when it really happens, it's very, very different. And so like when you're out there, um, you know, once you let the boat get out of sight, out of shouting distance, that's it. You're out there. You did it. You know, it's like bungee jumping. Once you lean too far out, you're falling. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, it's just, it's kind of crazy to do it. I mean, now I kind of, <laughs> yeah. I kind of scared. I kind of, I kind of did it a few times and then got, got my, got myself kind of scared straight for a while. Um, and I've been, I've been, I've done smaller ones. I've done more, more conservative ones. I mean, the last one I did actually was great because it, it went so well that there was no adventure. You know, I just sort of had a really relaxing time rafting through the Amazon, which was awesome. Oh, that's um, amazing. You know, no tragedies. I mean, you know, seeing uncontacted tribes and almost dying and all that stuff is great for, if, I guess, if you're, if you're in your early 20s and you're trying to write a book and have all these experiences and all that stuff, that's great. But like at this point, I'm like, yo, I, wanted, I want to do my work. I want to learn things. Um, I'm not yeah, trying less, to less have risk. a, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess also at this point, I, you know, I, I have backups for the backups. You know, I know, I know this environment so well um, that I, I don't feel like it's as much of a risk anymore. Even if you are that re- remote, I feel like the most, the thing I worry about the most is like an infection, you know, yeah. like I'm not going to break my leg. Like if it hasn't happened yet, it's, I'm not worried about it. Um, so you could take more calculated risks as you get, as you get more comfortable with it, I guess. But, but yeah, I, I went on some, I did, I made, I made some crazy decisions when I was like a kid, when I was like in my twenties, yeah. I was just, just it's, moronic. Anybody just go read your book and you'll just be like, I cannot believe anybody did this. It makes no sense at all. <laughs> it, makes, it makes, I, I look at the things that I did and I'm like, what was I thinking? I cannot yeah. believe that I did those things at all. So, yeah. Well, in terms of the how much mystery do you think is out there because it does seem like there's obviously there's tons of areas that people have not got to or at least modern day people do you think that there's still things in the rainforest in the amazon that we've never obviously i mean there's probably thousands of beetles that we've never discovered but do you think there's any large animal or something that's in there that we have yet to see yeah totally there's look i one of the things that that i realized is a the indigenous people are never wrong we might not understand what they're saying, but they're not wrong. Like they know what an anaconda looks like. And they, they constantly tell me that they've seen anacondas with ears, which is like comical. We all laugh, but then no, they're like, this is bigger than an anaconda and it has ears. (laughs) I've had multiple people tell me the same story. So either they're all like conspiring to fool this one gringo and they're, you know, like, or, um, but then also they just discovered a new, a new squirrel species in China. Um, Dude, there's, there's so many spots on the globe that haven't been discovered yet. And, and the other thing is that what you don't realize is that in the Amazon, let's just say on a given side of the Amazon, let's say in Peru, let's just say there's like three or four, you know, really premier research sites where like reputable scientists will go and spend time at field stations and they're doing bio surveys there. But most of these people are indoors science people that go there and they, I see what they do. They walk on a trail and they put their traps out for their beetles or the fireflies or whatever it is, or they put out thermometers in the forest, but they're still walking on a trail near a research site. It's an accessible place. But if you look at one river and then there's a 35 mile gap until the next right. river, what's in the middle of that spot? Has yeah. anyone been there? Probably not. 
So it's yeah. so interesting to think about. <laughs> this uh, dude, when I fly over the Amazon, I just look at it and it's like I'm drooling on there? the window. I'm like a dog. It's yeah. just there's there's because but then it's, it's you literally can't. Even I kind of kind of can't get to those places. You'd have to. You can't really get hella dropped. You'd have to you know get dropped off and then have a few people. But honestly, dude, going into jungle that once you're talking about like 30, 40 miles deep with no river access. See, the thing is, I always stay near the rivers. Because if right. shit gets bad, I can pop you open can raft my pack away. raft. Yeah, you can raft away. You can jump on a log. I mean, I've done this so many times. You jump on a log, you float down the river, and you're safe. But if you're the claustrophobia of being 150 feet under the canopy and 30 miles away from the nearest river, uh, then it starts to get like, okay, that's that's oh like some God. interstellar shit. Now it's like you, you've yeah. gone on to – now you're not just in space, but you went through a wormhole, and you're in a different dimension. And it's like, oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> and anything could yeah. be out there yeah literally i mean there's i i love to fantasize that there's still a giant ground sloth out there or something but i've heard that before as well yeah well there's tribes in the amazon thing. that still have like pelts from them and pelts in the tropical climate don't last long so it can't can't be that old um, wow not to mention that the pleistocene overkill extinction theory really basically says that humans did it and there's just not enough people in the amazon to have made the giant ground sloth extinct so there's right. some there's something missing there because it doesn't it doesn't quite add up. Um, how big is it? I forget how tall is it. Like five or six feet tall. Oh, I think uh, it, the, more than the that. American giant ground sloth, the North American giant ground sloth, was like thirteen feet tall. It was gigantic. Wow! It was That's absolutely so huge. At the Museum of Natural History in New York, they have one, and it's like it's just towers. It's like twelve feet tall. It's monstrous. It's so weird to think that those things were roaming around. Like, what the hell was going on? <laughs> yeah, no, and that wasn't that long ago. Like, human, yeah. straight up Homo sapiens were interacting with those things. I mean, um, giant ground sloths went extinct in North America, I think, like ten thousand years ago, and then in South America, yeah. like eight thousand years ago. But they didn't go extinct on the islands, on like Haiti and Cuba and stuff. Like, they didn't go extinct there until another five thousand years later, which which corresponds to when humans got there. And wow. so it's like, there's really, it's really, if there's not a lot of debate there. It's like, we, we killed them all. Yeah. 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 Um, it's so wild. Yeah. What, it's what really about, wild. As far as anacondas go in your, in your book, you talk about finding a massive one. Do you have any, have from talking to the tribes or anything in terms of the max, max size of an anaconda? Do you have any speculation on what that might be? Cause it's so mysterious. Um, I think max size is probably like what they say, like 30, 30, 30 or 32 feet. Mm. Um, I know that's massive, mean, which is absurd. I mean, the biggest one I ever jumped on, like I wrote about was that one was probably mm. about 26 feet. And it was just, I still think I like broke part of my brain just looking at that thing. I just, I still can't even, you know, digest what I saw. And then in captivity one time I saw a 26 foot reticulated Python that lives in this dude's basement what yeah it, oh this God. is like those things that like you just don't know until you end up i can't even it would take too long to explain how i got into this basement but there's a man <laughs> there's a man that has a basement and he's got a 26 foot reticulated python in it down Was this in, this in the dungeon. states or- yeah, it's in the states man oh, wow that's crazy yeah and uh you know he like feeds it deer roadkill and stuff but uh a 26 foot snake is 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 a record holder for captivity there's none bigger in the world yeah um I mean, this thing, think of, think of a basketball and then make, make that as long as a snake. It's that, it's that round, you know, it's, or maybe even bigger. I guess if it just ate, it would be even larger than that. Um, absolutely insane. I mean, its head is the size of a Great Danes. You know, this is a dragon. Yeah. Um, it's so yeah, wild. It's, it's, it's crazy. So, I mean, that's, that's the upper limits. And at 26 feet, they could eat you or me. No problem. That's not a problem for them. Oh, Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're pretty slender to them at that point. Oh yeah. Once they crush our, crush our bones down and, you know, get, get the arms worked off. It, no problem. They're eating deer. They're eating all kinds of other stuff. They could definitely, definitely take down a human. And that's why retics are the confirmed man eaters. They think they, they've cut a few people out of retics now on video. So there's no more debate about it. Even like 10 years ago, they were like, well, we're still not sure. Cause it's never been verified. And now the internet is just like full of videos of like, reticulated pythons eat some guy on a farm in indonesia and then they for yeah. some reason then we have to get them back we have to like get the body which i completely disagree with if i get eaten by a bear or something like dude 
Fair game. On bear please, foods. <laughs> please don't kill the bear. I want that like tattooed. On, well, I guess if it's tattooed, it doesn't matter. If I get eaten by a bear, no one will see it. But <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hopefully he doesn't eat your phone and there's like a message around. <laughs> yeah. In the event of a bear predation, please do not retrieve my remains. That's in my will. <laughs> yeah. But you actually, another crazy thing you did is you were part of the production of Eaten, uh, Eaten Alive where you tr- basically were trying to get eaten by an anaconda, <laughs> which, well, which is a wild. Tell I me tried. a little bit about that. Well, basically, Discovery Channel said, we, we don't think that um, you getting eaten. No, sorry. They said, basically, we don't think you studying anacondas is exciting enough. Uh, what else you got? And I was like, what are you talking about? I was like, these are the biggest snakes on earth in the most remote jungle. I was like, and they're like, yeah, we feel like we've seen it before. And some producer suggested like, you know, imagine if we could get somebody to go inside to get eaten, to prove that it's possible. And I was like, yeah, I'd do it. I mean, I guess it's possible. Like it was a very like off the cuff conversation. Um, and then we got a phone call a week later where they were like, yeah, we'll do it. Like we're in, like you have, like we'll, we'll put a $3 million budget on this show. and you have all the resources that's $3 million budget. Not that I got paid that. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. You know, and they basically were just like, yeah, whatever it takes. We'll and then spent, I spent working on this show, which was a huge, huge flop. Yeah. So, so how do you, I know like, obviously there's some reptile people who weren't super fond of it. And, and I, oh, how do you feel about it? Do you feel that it was effective or would you do it again? If it was offered to you again? Well, if I did it again, it would, cause they, I mean, I got, I got, I got, sort of got, you know, the kid in Hollywood, they flew me out to LA and they I shook a bunch of hands and they said, look, let's, you know, we film the show as you want it filmed. We make it about ecology and about the environment. We show your work. And then at the end, we'll just have this crazy stunt. And the, you know, they were like, you know, it's like hiding the broccoli under the, you know, the meat and potatoes. They're like, you know, they had all these like silly analogies and they were like, that'll get us the ratings. And then that's how you get people to hear your conservation message. And I was like, dude, I don't disagree with that. You know, I don't, I don't disagree with that. Um, and we filmed so much awesome stuff down there and about the bioaccumulation of mercury and how that goes into apex predators and how gold miners or I mean, everything about how was, we made it so beautiful. And I had this awesome team down there. We spent six weeks and then they chopped it up when we got to the city. And so like they did things like when we caught an 18 foot anaconda, I was like, Oh, she's so beautiful. This is like such an important animal and an apex predator. And I was like kissing her on the head and just like losing my mind, smiling and then the producer was like, so if this animal was to bite you, how bad would it be? I was like, dude, if she bit me, I was like, I'd probably bleed out instantly because her teeth are long enough to like reach my bones. And of course, they put that part in and they left out the appreciation part. And it's right. like they did that like 40 times through the two hour documentary. They included none of the science. And so when it came out, it was, um, let's see, first it was PETA and like those people were angry because they thought, what if I hurt the snake? And then, and that was like a lot of, uh, a lot of like reptile people came out and they're like, you're going to hurt the snake. And then I was like, all right, well, first of all, it already happened. No one seems to grasp that it already happened because they called the show eaten alive. And I don't know if everybody thought it was going to be a live show or something. Um, right. anyway, anyway, so yeah, it was just like, it turned into like a media frenzy, um, which was funny. It was comical. And then what the crazy thing was then like after the show, I thought maybe everyone would be like, oh, cool. Like nothing really happened obviously the snake isn't hurt and obviously this guy would never hurt a snake but then everyone was like you douchebag like we wanted to see a guy get eaten by a snake and it was like <laughs> um you can't win you cannot win and so and the fact that the show just wasn't wasn't very good what they cut together um and i i before before the show came out i like emailed discovery channel i was like i am not promoting this show and i was going on like i don't know it's a today show or good morning america whatever it was in the morning and uh they basically were like look let us let us know now if you're going to need any further reassurance that you're going to cooperate with us. And I got a very stern sort of talking to that implied that, uh, I would be extremely financially impoverished for generations to come if, if I didn't cooperate. Um, but it was, it was a weird situation and I learned a lot. It was like a, it was like some sort of weird movie where you're like a little bit too young and you believe these people in suits and then they, and they just sort of steal all your money or they, you know, take advantage of you. And so the, but the thing is once that reaches the news, you know, then it was like, so the herp community and like all like the people that have snakes at home were like, yo, fuck this guy. He almost like hurt a snake or like he made people scared of snakes. And I was like, dude, the only thing I was doing is like trying to protect their habitat and tell people how awesome they are. And then the conservation community was like, well, this isn't science. This isn't devout conservation. He tried something new and they were like, we didn't like it. And so really it just in every possible way, it was a huge, huge failure. But 
I learned a ton doing it and uh, got a lot of bad press and good press, which in this country doesn't really matter. Yeah, it's almost the same at this point. It's almost the same as um, everyone seems to keep wanting to prove without using their names. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> I'm so sick of hearing everybody's name. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it was, you know, th- that is sort of what it seems like because I think we're probably we grew up on discovery channel, which was like this amazing thing. You see all these great, dis- these shows that are so nature oriented and it slowly drifted away from that. And I could imagine that if as a conservationist discovery channel comes up to you and says, Hey, we want to do this. It's like, yeah, I definitely want to do that. But then you realize yeah. that it, it drifts to the entertainment value. Like I just did a podcast a few weeks ago with uh, Sergio Belguera, who is one of the, he's a, the, the uh, biologist who rediscovered the Aproporus Cayman in Colombia. And that was on wow. featured on the forest extinct or live show. Mm-hmm. And they sort of just make it seem like Forrest found it, even though Sergio found it a month before. And, and they turn it into something that is just totally not. And it's sort of like a fake show. And well, I, I, uh, it's, it was very strange. Dude, it's absolutely terrifying. I mean, I had, we were like in the Amazon um, with a film crew and we had things like, we'd be on the ground and I'd get like one of the, you know, like the DP would come up to me with like a sat phone and I'd get on the phone and be like, who is this? And they'd be like, well, it, don't worry about it. We're at Discovery Channel here. And I was like, oh, okay. And they'd be like, we need you to get in a fight. This is a real conversation, everybody. He goes, we need you to get in a fight with a bull shark for a commercial break. And I was like, excuse me. I was like, I just spent time getting research permits and we're like trying to like learn about how mercury relates to anacondas in the Amazonian, Amazonian ecosystem. And they were like, kid, listen, like bull shark focus. And I was like, there aren't bull sharks in this part of the Amazon and bull shark sharks in the Amazon are pretty rare. And where do you want me to find one? And how do you want me to fight it? And yeah. the guy was like, you're being very difficult. So he called back the next day and he goes, all right, well, since you, since you were so difficult about the bull shark, <laughs> we came up with this new plan where you guys are going to be riding on the river. And then uh, Paul, you're going to don't worry. He said this, he goes, don't worry. You'll look like the hero. He goes, you're going to be riding down the river and all of a sudden you'll see that there's a lot of piranha ahead. So you'll pull the boat over, pour a bucket of blood into the river and then go around the piranha. And I was like, sorry, sorry, sorry. But if we're in a boat, how would piranha possibly hurt us? Second of all, where would I get a bucket of blood? Um, uh, there's not this, this the idea doesn't make any sense. And they, so then I got the phone call from like the heavy suits where they were like, listen, kid, listen, see, there's $3 million on the line and you got to have some results for us. We need something scary. And they were like, you're not scared enough in the jungle. And I was like, well, we're not scared here. I was like, this is where we work. And they were like, you, they were like, you're not getting it. We're going to pull the plug on the show. So we had to fake that there was a, an encounter with an electric eel. We, had to, we basically <laughs> found ourselves acting though. So it was like gun against your head. It was like, what do you do? Yeah. You know, I was like, well, do you still want some of the show? Do you still want some of the opportunity that's going to happen? And you go, well, fine. I'll make this one concession. Sure. This just this once. And then next week you're in, the, we're out there for six weeks. And so it would just be like thing after thing after thing where they'd be like, do this. No, do this. No. And then they'd be like, well, we'll pull the plug if you don't do this. And it's like, oh shit. You know, that, that's amazing. It's crazy. And what you have is a bunch of dudes who've never left LA sitting there in like LA and DC sort of like throwing back and forth, like what they think would be like a cool idea. Um, and then bouncing it off their superiors who are like 70 years old sitting in an office somewhere. And and then like, they check that with the advertising. It's just, it's such a corporate thing. Um, I know they came it's out so with crazy. a show where they were like discovering snow leopards or discovering tigers in a new location. And it was like the local people have known about that for ages, but yeah. they got like a team of like, you know, like, flashy guys to go in there and do like some like hardcore kayaking and be like dude i found tigers on my camera trap and it's like all right well sure so there's nothing good about yourself yeah i mean it's just so can you believe anything that they're saying no yeah it's it's it is so wild that yeah everything is fabricated everything is meant to keep the person hooked until the commercial's over so they come back you know how is he going to turn out with that bull shark got to keep watching and it ends up just having no science which is what discovery channel was like discovery that's what it was the purpose of it and now it's (laughs) essentially just a reality show well yeah i mean mtv was music videos at some point right Um, yeah exactly yeah it's it's crazy but i also think that that's why we're seeing such a huge i mean kind of like ever you know there's so much talk of change this week um Mm -hmm. but we're, we're sort of we've sort of already started seeing that where it's like you know when i see a, a news story now after after being a news story now when i see a news story i don't believe shit about it yeah i mean it's it, which is kind of difficult because then if somebody says like well you know um something something you know there, a new attack happens like all right well 
did it happen? You know, or was it? And because you don't know how many people, the people on the ground reported it to a news agency, which put their tilt on it, which cut the footage in a certain way. And it's like, by the time you're getting it in the context of your living room, can you believe it anymore? Yeah. You know? But all you need to do is watch a news story in a field that you happen to be an expert in, which might be yes. you know, rare once in a while. And then you yes. watch it, you're like, what the hell? You're like, that is way off. Like nothing oh, yeah. they said in that makes sense. But all the other news stories you're watching, you're like, okay, wow, I can't believe that happened. <laughs> wow, that's a really that's a really good point. I didn't even think of that. You're right. It's like when a yeah. doctor watches like a medical drama and they're like, this is total horse shit. Yes, I, my yeah. fiance is a nurse. so I can't even watch any medical shows. She's like, what the heck? They didn't, why did they wash their hands? Like they would never have those cables hanging there and all these weird things that I'm just like, wow, I can't believe that's how a hospital is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's like any, 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 literally any movie that has to do with the jungle. I'm like, why are they doing all this dumb shit? that no one would yes. ever do like it just it's, it's yeah. too, i'm sure i'm sure your fiance is the same way where it's like i'd like to play along but this is just fucking make-believe like you just can't do <laughs> yeah. this like it pulls you out of the moment too it much. pulls you way out of it you just start laughing at it there yeah. was that movie yeah. last year i think it was called the jungle I, and was it daniel radcliffe and he kind of yeah, yeah, yeah and he's it. Oh, I you! I don't think you should see it. <laughs> but there's this scene where there's a snake scene, and he oh. he pulls a carpet python out of a tree, and I'm just like, what? Why yeah. didn't they at least ask to make sure that? Because he was in South America, it's like that. Why? You I'll should never Google ever South America that. snakes. I'll never understand that stuff. They do that, especially with snakes. They do that all the time. I just watched a movie, which I thought was a really good movie. It was called Mud, and it had Matthew McConaughey and Sam Shepard and a bunch of people in it. Um, but, you know, there's this one scene where they're going through the forest and the kids are like, watch out, there's snakes down there. And there's like a puddle and it's got all these, I mean, they look like, I don't know, they look like black rat snakes or something, but they're just like a bunch of snakes that they, somebody put in a puddle and they're all swimming around <laughs> and they're like, watch out for the snake. That's the snake pit. And I'm like, this is not real. This is, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I get it. I get it. It's a movie they need to put. But at some point though, I mean, that's like, we still have rattlesnake roundups now, you know, yeah. we still have people. I follow um, a lot of accounts that I disagree with because I believe that being educated on, I mean, look, you got to go hang out with loggers before you can employ loggers, right? Um, exactly. So yeah. I, I, I hang out with a lot of ne'er-do-well people for that reason. Um, but I follow like some like really douchey, like trophy hunting and just like really bro like hunting websites. And there was just this guy um, who posted a video on Instagram and it was like, he was just through his like thermal scope was just shooting a rattlesnake with like a high powered rifle. And I was just like, what? I, I left a comment. I was like, so you're going to eat that? Like, but like, do you think you're cool? Like, do, does this, does this, is this, is this making you feel manly? What, what are you, what are you getting out of this, man? Yeah. What's the point? I mean, it's a rattlesnake. It's a, uh, uh, but they have, they have a totally different, he, uh, you know, this guy has a totally different perspective. He's like, you know, they call them rattle bugs. First of all, I don't know what part of the country he's from, but, I've never heard that rattled bugs. Um, <laughs> yeah, me either. Um, but they and but they like, see it as like an insect, an insect to just destroy, right? Yeah, it's like it's like this this piece of vermin, um, which is so foreign to me. And of course, then then he'll you know he'll do another post where he's talking about he's talking about like you know um, how he's a conservationist hunter and all this bullshit. But um, I mean, I've I've taken so many people that'll like you know, especially, especially women seem to think it's like, it's almost fun to be scared of things. And then like, I, I, I had a friend who was, you know, I was like, don't show me a spider. Oh my God, snakes. I don't even want to look at a picture of it. And then yes, yeah. somehow, I don't know why she came to the Amazon. Um, and this girl was absolutely crying. I had a little baby Amazon tree bow in my hands, like the cutest little thing ever. Um, and she was straight up crying, like standing 15 feet away crying. And I was like, what is the matter with you? And so that's yeah. how that went. And then the next, I kept the snake overnight instead of releasing it. And then the next day I was like, look, I want you to do something. I want you to sit on the couch next to me while I handle it and just breathe. And then it was like 10 minutes went by and she's like, wow, look at that tongue going. And I was like, yeah, he's just trying to see what's going on. And she's like, what are those holes in his face? I was like, well, those are his pits. He's, you know, those are the heat sensing. And then the, the following night I was like, look, just put your hand on your lap and I'm just going to, I'm going to let the snake's tail touch you. And P.S. The end of this story is that by the end of the week, this same person that was like crying and like literally co like convulsing at the idea of a snake, not only realized that she could hold a snake, but then felt all powerful for overcoming her fear. And then suddenly was like obsessed with snakes and now like sends me pictures all the time of like, oh, my God, I saw a snake. Oh, my God, my friend saw a snake. What is it? And it's like complete conversion. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's amazing. It's, it's just, that <laughs> it's just taking that fear to just yeah. realizing the fear is just because it's unknown, right? They're, they don't know the, how the animal works and they're afraid of it. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. I, I think a lot of times it's like, well, when I was a kid, other people said it's scary. So I just assumed mm-hmm. it was scary. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I guess they, I mean, when you grow up in New York, I mean, people like, well, other, I mean, a lot of New Yorkers, if you're like, oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to Sudan. People are like, you're going to Sudan, you're definitely going to die. It's like, well, dude, half my, <laughs> so many people I know work there professionally like just relax yeah. you know whatever you heard and on like you know when you watch Blood Diamond or something like just relax <laughs> yeah. it's not exactly like that all it's the not time. exactly <laughs> like that just like the river isn't the same every day yeah um, yeah. yeah so it's it's just people, people people are crazy but I think I think that what we're what we're seeing right now is just like that things are more complex like we, we basically I think have to figure out if we're really smart monkeys or if we're actually capable of being like, okay, like, you know, so should, should I go down there and shoot the loggers or should I go hang out and talk to the loggers and see what's going on? Why are they logging? Is there another yeah. way, you know? And that same thing with the one thing snakes. we can do is yeah. communicate. Yeah. Spend the time, get educated about the thing that you hate, you know, or the people yeah. that you hate. Cause I don't think I had a lot of, I've met two people that I honestly think the world would just be better without <laughs> in my entire <laughs> life. Like I've met two people that I was like, oh, this person's like a total piece of shit. Every yeah. single other yeah. person, usually if a person's like mean or nasty or takes advantage or something, it's like, it's usually because there's something that, you know, stressed them out or scared them or some financial pressure or something that you could usually just be like, Hey man, what's going, what's really going on here and get past it. There's only, you know, there's been the, I guess it's a spectrum, right. On, you know, oh, I had a past trauma, so sometimes I steal things, or I'm hungry, so sometimes I steal things. To like, yeah, Ted Ted Bundy was uh, abused when he was a kid, but he eats people, so we're just yeah. gonna kill him. <laughs> like, yeah, you yeah. Know, it's like there's a spectrum Went a little of like, too far. <laughs> yeah, it's like, well, I, I, you can be redeemed, and then there's some people where you're like, all right, like let's 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 be real here. Too many lines have been crossed. <laughs> too many too many lines have been crossed, but but in, for the most part, for the most part, I feel like uh, most of the people I meet are you know. Just, just trying to, just trying to get by, and we'll, we'll, we'll shut up and calm down if you, if you listen to them. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think that's what's so great about your work is it, it doesn't create that animosity in a way. You're just showing people that how amazing it is, and and like the story we, we shared earlier with the with the knee surgery. It's certain things people can help the Amazon just by you know being at home and, and sending five dollars that way. There's so much you can do. So oh, it's, sure. I think the work that you're doing is is, is amazing. And I know you. you recently wrote an, another book as well. Was that last year it was released or? Yeah, it was last fall that it came out and then the book tour and everything and the promotion of it kind of got put on hold. So I'm actually going to kind of, I'm going to try and just like reboot it because otherwise it's going to be a victim of coronavirus where it's like one of those things that just didn't happen, like the Olympics and the NBA season, like, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, but a book, you put so much into it. That's really, that's that's not okay. So I'm gonna, definitely going to keep going on that. Um, yeah, The Girl and the Tiger is sort of, it's not at all like mother of god it reads much more like the jungle book or something but it's all it's basically you know a bunch of stories that happened to me um and that i experienced living in south india and uh a girl really did message me and say you know i'm just young girl she'd actually come to the amazon with her parents and i realized that she was this huge nature lover and she had this amazing connection with animals and one day i got an email from her saying hey uh there's, I just heard that there's tiger cubs that got orphaned and I'm going to go save them because no one else will do it. And she was like 15 at the time. Wow. Um, and it was just, that's just, that, that was just insanity. And so it sparked this whole story about like how Bengal tigers are surviving mm-hmm. in South India. And like the, the book, um, it came out from a small publisher, but my God, the, the reviews have been like really, really cool and encouraging. And people have been like saying wonderful things about it. So I guess people like it. Um, but yeah, no, I, 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 they say, write the story that you want to read. You know, and I, I sort of just did that. I just sort of had fun. It was just sort of like, well, what's an updated jungle book? You know, what's, what do I yeah. want to, how do I want to take this? And it's, it's, it's a, it's a ton of fun. It's, and it's more brutal than most people think. I feel like for some reason people keep, they, you know, they read this title, just like mother of God, people were like, well, I don't want to read a book about God. It's like, well, that's the name of the region. So calm yeah. down. Um, <laughs> yeah. And this, I, someone recently, one of my friends was like, you know, you know, I thought, you know, the girl and the tiger, he's like, I thought it would be like something kind of sweet. And he was like, dude the ending of that book is fucking brutal. He was like, you're, you're he's like, you're messed up, man. I was like, yeah, well, um, just telling the truth, just telling the truth. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, I mean, everything in that book is, um, pretty much true. I mean, it's like about what tigers and elephants and tribal people in India go through to survive. So, so yeah, it is. Right. 
Um, well, I'll definitely have to pick that book up as well because uh, if it's anything like Mother of God, I know I'll, I'll really enjoy it. And, and the other thing, I will, we'll wrap up right away because I want to let you get on with the rest of the day, but something that, that's really cool that I learned in Mother of God is that you didn't have a great time through school, through high school, and now you're this author, which is sort of <laughs> probably the last thing you thought you would have been, which is kind of crazy. Yeah. I mean, I was this delinquent failure in school and that's partly because I have dyslexia and partly just because I won't listen to authority and I won't do what you tell me to do. And I was bored. Um, but yeah, um, I, I always loved listening to stories. My parents read to me when I was a kid and, um, but yeah, somehow I just started writing things down. I mean, I guess that was, that was always sort of something I enjoyed. And so, yeah, I have, I have, I have articles now, you know, as a, I have articles in a, in, in, in a textbook. There's a British textbook that has my articles, which is like so trippy. Um, you're like, I was, if I was in school, I wouldn't read those. <laughs> I, exactly. And it's like, I almost want to put a little article after the article and be like, dear, whoever's reading this, like I was the worst student ever. This, you know, the teachers, I was like in detention more than I was in class or suspended. Um, I failed more classes than like, you know, it's like, I just think it's such a ridiculous thing that they're letting my writing be shown to students. It's just, come on guys. That's, yeah, that's, that's pretty just, cool. That's just comical. Yeah. That, that's, that's a weird one. I never saw that one coming. Um, but no, I definitely, um, I just want people to know as we go though, that, that, um, this, like we just talked about so many ways that you can like be effective and make things happen. And all this jungle stuff that we're talking about, that's what Tamandua expeditions does. We bring people down to the Amazon and all the local guys from Victor, whose leg just got fixed while we were on this call, um, to JJ, who still works with me and still runs all the operations. I mean, all these indigenous guys now are conservationists. We turned illegal gold miners. Me and Trevor Frost from National Geographic went and we spoke to these illegal gold miners. And we, I mean, the shit we saw was crazy. They were fighting with the Peruvian Navy and all this stuff. And we were like, wouldn't you rather just show gringos around the jungle? And they were like, yeah, sure. Now we're doing that. And we turned them into conservationists. And it's just like, boom, boom, boom. But it all does depend on people deciding to travel to the Amazon, people saying that they want to have like that sort of big high powered adventure and reconnect with nature and do something good. And uh, so it's not, you know, I feel like a lot of times it's always like, Oh, donate, give us $5. It's like, no, well this, you, you get like this awesome life changing experience. You're coming to the jungle. Yeah. You know, it's yeah, like, that's and so true. just it's, that it's an easy way to do travel. it. Yeah. It's like, we're not asking, we're not asking you for anything. We're just, we're just, we're providing you with a chance. And just, just so you know, as a side benefit, all these people get jobs and because they have jobs, with the forest, they protect it. So, so it's, cool. it's really and cool. I, I definitely want to make my way down there. As I said through email that, uh, I, this this podcast is a supporter of the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy, which has land that's uh, fairly close to to where you are at when you're they're down. They're actually my next door so. neighbors. Yeah, they're right there. Yes, it, next door neighbors in Amazon terms, it's, it, but it is actually pretty close. Maybe like oh, thirty. Like, I don't even know. It's it's really yes. Yeah, it, it takes like a half hour by boat to get to them. Yeah, next door so neighbors I, by Amazon terms, exactly. Yeah, yeah, they're not next door, but they are very close. And if, out of all the places, it's, it was. I was really amazed that as I was reading your book, I was like starting to you know go on Google Maps to see where it was, and I couldn't believe that it was so close. So that was really cool. Yeah. Can you let everybody know where? So I, I want to know where you can find the expeditions as well as yourself and everything to do with the books as well online. Um, really, um, my Instagram at Paul Rosalie, um, my website paulrosalie.com. I'm constantly posting all the, you know, sort of updates from the field and all the videos and footage of, there's a lot of snakes. There's a lot of snakes. A lot of people look at my Instagram and they're like, you're a snake guy. And I'm like, well, there's more to me than that. But, um, but yeah, <laughs> most all of the, the people stuff... listening are snake, snake people. So, yeah, I know, so exactly. Um, no, so yeah, I mean, I have to say like in, Instagram, everything, you can find all the books. Um, most of the video stuff I post on there, I am going to be starting um, I think like in like two weeks, I'm going to be releasing uh, a Patreon to sort of a lot of so many people message me and they want to know like how they can get more involved and how they can sort of like start working in conservation or start, you know, just di- more directly like than just like sort of following and liking things. Um, so I'm going to be like trying to trying to almost start like a conservationist school, sort of like how to how even people that are committed to their normal lives, jobs, families can still start doing things where they are going to end up in the jungle sometimes and helping the rainforest and getting to experience these things. I just want to keep keep this machine going because we're having so much positive effect with it. It's just, it's just been incredible. I love that. That is awesome. Well, I'll make sure I'll have that all in the show notes. People can find that and whatnot. And Paul, thank you so much. This was a pleasure. I really enjoyed this conversation. So thank you for joining me. Absolutely, man. Thank you so much for having me on. 
All right, that brings us to the end of that episode. Paul, thank you very much for joining me on the podcast and thank you for being so flexible. I know we had re- planned on recording at a different date and then my computer blew up and you were happy to change dates. So that was fantastic. Thank you for the work that you're doing and the stories that you have are absolutely incredible. For the listener, if you want to hear Paul go into crazy detail for the stories that we were talking about throughout this podcast, go pick up the book, Mother of God. Everything will be in the show notes. Go buy the book. You can you will read it in much more details than you could ever get to through a podcast. I just kind of wanted to give everybody just a bird's eye view of all the crazy things that Paul's up to. And of course, you can follow him on Instagram to stay up to date with his adventures. And again, I just want to thank Joe from Port City Pythons for sending me the book in the mail because this interview would definitely not have happened without me receiving the book from him. So thank you. Thank you very much. I'm currently working on some very exciting projects to do with the podcast and Animals at Home, so I can't wait to share that with you guys. That should be out in the next week or so, so definitely stay tuned. If you're not subscribed on YouTube or the any podcasting app, definitely do that so you don't miss it. And if you are interested in helping out with the podcast, the best thing you can do is just share the content. Share it with your friends and your family on social media, however you want, especially an episode like this where the content is not specifically reptile related. This has a lot broader of an audience, so please feel free to share this. I would really, really appreciate it. Thank you very much to CustomReptileHabitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. If you are looking for any new reptile-related equipment, go check them out. Affiliate links are in the show notes as well as the YouTube description. And of course, affiliate link means that if you do buy something, a commission does come back to me, which helps support the show at no extra cost to you. I will see you guys next week.